Well, we are in the last week uh, of a series uh, that we're calling We Pursue. Uh, it's the last week. Thank you. I really had to wait there, guys. I was like, you know, this is, this is really sad, you know. But uh, we've, been, we've been exploring kind of the story of our church and where the Lord has kind of led us, where he's brought us from, and the unfolding story that is Abundant Life Church. And we've been kind of looking at some new language, and I know we've talked about it over the last few weeks, but this is my last opportunity to really kind of sew this in. And we've been looking at this idea that God has called us, a church of regular people, to live out God's extraordinary story the way Jesus shows us. And how many of you think, man, I want to be a part of that. I can do that, right? Because we want to be more like Jesus. And in fact, the reason why we're doing that is really rooted in Habakkuk 3 2, which says that we want to see the fame and the deeds of God renewed in our day. And boy, do we live in a world that needs Jesus. And so it doesn't need you and I. It doesn't need our best ideas. It doesn't need the latest trends. We live in a world that needs Jesus. And so we want to position and posture ourselves to be a church that has Jesus at the center. He's our foundation. But we're moving forward. We're pursuing him. And in pursuing him, God uses us. He involves us in his story. And so we've kind of outlined a few pursuits that we have as a church. The first one was that we pursue the presence of God together. And the reason why we do that is because it's always been God's heart to be present with his people. Aren't you glad that God is not someone that is distant, right? God's not somebody that's out there and far away and doesn't really care. No, no, no. Jesus, God is with us. God wants to abide with us. And so we want to be the kind of church that pursues his presence, knowing that that's his heart's desire for us. Now, we have identified that a couple of ways that we do that is through this culture of worship and prayer. And the idea is that, that we want to create spaces and places, a culture and environment where we are a worshiping and praying people. How many of you once again know the church, or sorry, the world needs a praying church? Amen. The world needs a church that is willing to stand in the gap. And I tell you what, man, I was moved to tears this week as we saw all that is unfolding in Ukraine and in that area of the world. And then, you know, it's really kind of the first time that we've seen kind of a war unfold on social media. It's like the first live streamed war. And I'm telling you, some of the things are obviously tragic and heartbreaking. But then as I was kind of doing a bit of a deeper dive and starting to realize that the church in Ukraine is standing, worshiping, and praying in the midst of the circumstances that are going on. Because what the world needs is not a, a church that has an opinion, not a church that is kind of trying to build its own thing. The world needs a church that is yielded and surrendered as worshiping and praying and seeking after God. That's the kind of church that we want to become. I believe it's the kind of church that we are. And all we're going to do is just start fanning the flame of that to say, Lord, more of that. We want to be more prayer, more worship, because we want to be those who are pursuing your presence so that your presence might be in us and flow through us to make a difference in the world in which we live. Then we talked about this idea that we pursue the formation of people because we defined or we, we came to this kind of conclusion that Christianity isn't attendance on a Sunday. Christianity isn't some moral checklist. Christianity isn't even a set of behaviors or beliefs. Christianity is you and I becoming more and more like Jesus. And so at the end, I'm a simple guy, so I like it nice and simple, okay? Now that's a complex and a difficult thing to do, right? But at least I know what the goal is. The goal is that every single one of us, that we as this body of believers, this family of God together, are becoming more and more like Jesus. That when people look at us, they go, there's something different about them. There's something different about Abundant Life Church. There's something different when they show up and serve at the Portland Rescue Mission, or they go to Kenya, or, or they go over to Israel, or they go to Puerto Rico. There's something different about this body of believers. You know what it is? We're, we're trying to become more and more like Jesus. We're not trying to become more and more like the world. We're not trying to become more and more like the cultural values of the world or the story that the world is telling us. We are trying to become more and more like Jesus. And here's the good news. You don't have to do that in your own strength. Why? Because his personal presence is with you. 
The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He's helping you, empowering you. Galatians tells us this way, to live in the spirit, walk in the spirit, be led by the spirit. We want to be a people of God, God's personal presence empowering us, not just to overcome sin, but as we discovered that week, God imputes his righteousness. He actually helps us become more and more and more like Jesus. And so we want to pursue his presence. We want to pursue the formation of people. And then last week we talked about this, that we want to be pursue being a Christ-centered church. We sing that song, Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And then we talked, we, we talked about last week about this idea that we want to relate to each other and the world, each other and, the, and Jesus the same way that Jesus relates to us, which wasn't based on a contract, remember? You do this, I do that. No, it's based on covenant relationship. See, God's in covenant relationship. He's all in, in sickness and in health. Richer are for poor. Things, you're being faithful or not being faithful. God is all in through Jesus Christ in covenant relationship with you. And because he is, we can be all in in relationship with one another. So the church that we're building here and the church that Jesus is building isn't a church where there's a quid pro quo where it's like, if you do this, I'll do that. No, no, no. I'm all in. Come rich or poor, come sickness and health, whether you're in or not in, I'm going to choose to try to live as Jesus lived toward you. And I hope that every single one of us, can you imagine what kind of church would get built if we all lived that way? That's what Jesus is after. You see, Jesus is going, or God's going to present a bride, right? Pure and spotless. And I believe that this is the work that Jesus is doing in each one of us. He's doing in this body. And so this week, I want to close out the series by talking about our fourth and final pursuit. And it's simply this. We pursue neighborhoods to nations. We pursue joining God's restorative work locally and globally, by generously using all that God has given us for his glory and the good of others so that people might be saved and live out God's story. We pursue joining God's restorative work. Now, I don't know about you, especially this week, and I I started writing this message a couple of weeks ago, so I didn't know what was going to happen this week, but When you look at the world in which you live, it could be very easy to come to a conclusion that goes something like this. I think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, Gareth, are you serious? We join God in his restorative work? I'm not so sure that God is really restoring things. It kind of feels like he's letting it burn out, and then he'll just kind of start over again, right? Right? Well, while we might want to believe that, and mild circumstances might cause us to look at things like that, I mean, when you think about it, there are wars, right? Obviously, this week, that's all front of mind for all of us, probably in this room, if you've been watching the news at all. In in the city in which uh, we reside, there's been, you know, in this Portland metro area, there's been some 200 plus shootings this year. Homelessness, drug addiction, mental health issues, race issues, economic instability, the sexual ethic of our day. And in the region of the country that we live in, only 6% of the population goes to church on a Sunday morning. By the way, the national average is 32. We're lagging behind a little bit. God, are you really restoring things? Are things unraveling? And I could see where it would be really easy to kind of see kind of how that, how we could come to that conclusion. In fact, if we were to, you know, do kind of a little sociological thing and go back, even back to the Enlightenment and back to the Industrial Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution gave way to the Technology Revolution, and that period of human history is known as modernism, and the promise of modernism was that things are just going to get better and better and better. And then World War I happened. And then World War II happened. And then the UN gets formed, and you know, as a result of all those things, but the Cold War happens. And here we are in 2022 with what seems to be a resurgence of some of the things that are going on. 
And, and it's like the world and, and the, the identity of the world in which we live has moved from kind of modernism and been replaced then with postmodernism, which is a reaction to modernism, which is this, the promise of progress failed, and so we're just going to be cynical about it. And the cynicism of postmodernism gives way to this age of disenchantment, which is just like, que sera, sera. I mean, nothing ever works. Here we go again, round and round we go. Is God really restoring and involved in restoring this planet? And I've got good news because I think he is. How many of you know God is not sitting on the throne, biting his nails, anxious, wondering what to do? I'm going to say that again. How many of you know that God is not sitting on the throne, biting his nails, anxious, and wondering what to do? God is in control. And in spite of the circumstance, in spite of the challenges, in spite of all of the difficulties that we face, not just as a society and as a world, you face them internally. You face them in your family. You face them in your little sphere of work or, or where you do life. We all are wrestling with and trying to process through, God, are you really in control? And this is a verse that I've just been meditating on this week because it says in Psalm 24, verse 1, and this is why it's so important that we are grounded in God's word because we'll be pushed around by the culture and by the stories that media tells us, right? And the things that we see, we take in. Not that those things aren't real, they're happening. But my question to you is, what is it that grounds us? What is it that grounds you? For me this week, it's been Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. And so in spite of what you see going on in the world, in spite of what you see going on in the nation, in spite of what you see going on in this region, city, in spite of what you might even be experiencing in your own world, in your own little sphere, God is still in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the world and all its people belong to him. God is still in control. That ought to strengthen our hearts. That ought to give us a conviction, a place from which to live. And so how do we respond? If God wants us to join us in his restorative work, how is it that we're supposed to respond to all that we see going on in the world around us? Well, there's a, a passage of scripture, and we might do a series out of this book at First Peter later this year because... This is a great book uh, that really is encouraging for the church because we realize that in 1 Peter, Peter is writing to a church that is being persecuted. And I'm not, I'm not beginning to say that we as a church are being persecuted, but there's a church that's facing the pressure of the culture and the world in which they live. How is it that they're supposed to respond? Nero is the, the emperor at this time, and he's burning buildings and destroying parts of Rome and parts of the foreign countries that he's overtaken. And, and Nero then turns around and blames it all on the Christians, right? And so how is the church, how did the church respond in this moment? Well, this is what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. So how Humble yourselves before the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm. Come on, stand firm. I should tell you about some of the texts I get from my son and just the, the culture and the environment and the assignments that he's given. And I'm so proud of this young man who at 22 years old is standing firm in his faith. Who said, I know where, I know where my, bread, my, butter's bread, my bread is buttered, right? That's how it goes, <laughs> right? I know where I'm supposed to stand. So stand firm against him, the devil, and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory. That's that invitation into his story by means of Jesus Christ. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Why? Because all power to him forever. Amen. Come on, that's the assurance that we have, right? We have a firm foundation. 
And we get to stand on that firm foundation. We get to understand that in spite of what we see around us, God is still at work. God, the earth still belongs to the Lord. The people belong to the Lord. That the Lord is working out his purpose, his plans in the midst of all that would be going on in the world in which we live. And so we don't stand on circumstance. We stand on Jesus Christ. He is our firm foundation. And it's really challenging because oftentimes, you know, it's easy to look at a cultural moment or a moment in time and allow our lives to be dictated by that moment because we forget the story, the bigger story that you and I are part of. And the moment, of course, isn't the whole story. And oftentimes what we try to do is we, we look at a moment in time and we try to interpret the whole story based on the moment. How many of you know you can't interpret the whole story based on the moment? But the whole story gives context to the moment in time. My wife and I, we were, uh, we were pastoring out in New York. We'd been out there nine years. And the Lord spoke to us and, and uh, really, really clearly and said, your time is done. The work that I brought you here to do, you've accomplished. And so we had uh, raised somebody up. They took the church and we took that step of faith. It was a little bit like Abraham. You know, have you ever been in one of those moments where the Lord says, follow me? And you go, where? And he says, just follow me. Well, I'll follow you, but I'd like to know where, you know? <laughs> Well, we had about a seven-month period where the Lord, we had kind of raised somebody up. We'd handed the church over, and we're there sitting in the front row, worshiping and praying and going, God, you said to follow you. And then the Lord said, I want you to put your house on the market. And I go, but God, I don't know where I'm going. And, and then in my mind, I'm thinking, in New York, it takes a really long time to sell a house. And then it takes about three months to close the house. So I'm sitting and thinking, well, I maybe have five months now, you know, if I do it that way, you know. I'm making my plans, but God orders our steps, Right put the house on the market, and when you know the first person that comes and looks at it, buys the house, I'm like, God, what are you doing? And I remember in that moment, in that moment, I was, it, I was interpreting my entire life based on the moment. Have you ever been there? You ever been in a low place? You ever been in a bad place? You ever been in a place where life doesn't make sense and this moment doesn't make sense? And because the moment doesn't make sense, what we do is we go, well, all of life doesn't make sense now. What the Lord is saying or what Peter was saying to this church is, I want you to lift up your head. I want you to, to look to the hills from where your help comes from, right? That, that we don't interpret the world. We don't interpret the story that we're a part of based on the moment. We allow the story that we're a part of to interpret the moment. And so we've got to be those kinds of people. We've got to be the kinds of people that are not intimidated by the moment, but understand the greater story that we're a part of. And what's that story? God's restoring all things. I've read the end of the book. I don't know if you have. It's Revelation 21 and 22. It's really scary. And it says that God creates, there's, there's a new heavens and a new earth. God is working towards this renewal of all things. That everything would be as it was meant to be. It's this Hebrew word. We talked about it. Shalom. And the early church had some things that really anchored them. That helped them live out what we just talked about. Which is this idea that we're part of a bigger story. It's not about the moment. It's about the bigger story. And there were four things that they really believed that helped anchor them. And the first thing is this. It's actually a little phrase that we use around Easter time. You know, when you show up on Easter morning... You go, he is risen, right? And what is it you respond with? He is risen. risen indeed. And we like to use that phrase around Easter. But in the early church, they used that phrase all the time. He is risen. He's risen. He's risen. And when they would use the phrase, something was building in their spirit and their heart. He is risen. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Why did that matter so much? Well, according to 1 Peter, we're told that the hope of your life, the living hope that you and I have, is founded and grounded in the resurrection. See, we're not a people who live with hope like, like I hope the Seahawks can hold on to Russell Wilson this year. I hope. I'm not personally, I'm, I'm you know, empathizing with you Seahawks fans, you know, that you know, I hope maybe we could make it to the playoffs next year, right? Like, that's wishful thinking. But what, what Jesus gave, gives us through the resurrection isn't wishful thinking. It's a concrete conviction. We win. We overcome. 
Jesus is restoring all things. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you and I have life, not just any, all the, any kind of life. We have abundant life. Amen. We live a different way. We live out of a different story. Why? Because he's risen. And so the early church would have these four things. The first thing was, he is risen. The second thing was this, he is Lord. All authority has been given to him on he in heaven and on earth. And because all authority, I've, I've, I've done a, I'm not a Greek nerd, but I've done a deep dive on the Greek for all. And all means all. Like everything. Nothing is missing. All authority has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Which means that when you think about that circumstance in your life that seems to be out of control, when you think about go to, from that micro to the macro and what we're watching unfold in Eastern Europe, and it seems so out of control. No, 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 no. The Lord, he's in control. See, not only has he risen, and I have this concrete conviction, I have a hope that's unshakable, but he's also Lord which means he's in charge, he's in control. And even though the circumstance looks like it's not going the way you think it should go, God is still in control. You ever been there? You ever been there where you go, you know, like, God, I just feel like, uh, like, like, like it's out of control. Lord, are you really there? Do you really care, right? And then there's this moment in time when all of those fears, all of those stresses, all of those pressures, all of those anxieties and doubts disappear. Why? Because God shows up. I mean, I've been in control the whole time. Yeah, I know you don't like getting to the bottom of the ninth, right? Three balls, two strikes. I get it. I understand that you don't like that. But I'm teaching you something. I'm always in control. Always in control. And so the early church would say, he is risen. He is Lord. And then the next thing that they would build their convictions on is the fact that he is making all things new. This is what God is up to. God is not, if God is Lord, right? If God is risen, or Jesus is risen, right? We recognize that he's up to something. Then what he's up to is he's renewing all things. God wins. It's not like we just hang on and there's this little tiny remnant and hopefully we make it to heaven and we all get, we all kind of, you know, you've ever been, you ever seen one of those movies, you know, where like people rush in and then all of a sudden there's like an explosion and a ball of fire and it goes right past the doorway and you go, glad we made it. That's not the story of the Bible. That's not how God works. That's not what God's up to. God is renewing all things. And it's why when I, when I look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, and this, man, this week I was just so moved in prayer, so moved by what I was seeing. And here you have a church that's gathered, and they're singing, he will hold me fast. I don't know if you know that hymn. It's one of my favorite hymns. But here they are in Ukrainian, in the midst of shelling and bombing and all of these things going on, and the body of Christ is gathered singing, he will hold me fast. He's renewing all things. He's got me. He's got my heart. He's renewing me. And I know that there's other brothers and sisters in Christ all over Ukraine, all over Russia, all over Europe, all over Iraq and China and Asia. God is renewing all things. And out of the people of the world, he's calling himself, he's bringing to himself a covenant people. And all things will be restored. So Jesus is risen. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is restoring all things. And the last thing that the early church built uh, this foundation on was simply this, that God determines the times and the seasons. And you see this in Acts chapters, I think it's 17 verses 24 through 28. Um, Paul's been debating with these philosophers and he basically says, look, it's in Christ that we have our life, that he's the one that orders the times and the seasons. And what he was trying to communicate to them and what we ought to learn from the Bible is that the Lord has actually placed you and I right here, right now for his purpose. Now, we don't oftentimes think about that or live that way, do we? But the early church bought into this idea that in spite of persecution, in spite of things maybe not going the way that they thought it ought to go, in spite of all the world that was going on in the world, that the God had placed them here and now to make a difference. They were ambassadors for the king to the kingdoms of the world. And so when you begin to realize that, man, that this is how the early church built. 
They understood he's risen, he's Lord, he's renewing all things. Oh, and he placed us right here, right now, because through us, he wants us to be partnering with him in this journey or this story of restoring all things. Kind of changes how we live life, doesn't it? All of a sudden, your job is not your job anymore. All of a sudden, the neighborhood that you live in is not just a neighborhood that you decided to live in because you like the house. All of a sudden, you start to realize that because he's risen and because he's Lord and because he's renewing all things, Jesus actually placed you and me in the jobs that we're in, in the places that we live. Now, you might not like it, but this is what God has done. God placed you here for a purpose. I had, a, I had a coffee with uh, Michael. Michael's sitting over here, and I asked his permission to share this story this week, but Michael's had an amazing testimony, an amazing story of redemption, and I'm really proud of this man and just hearing his story, but what impressed me this week was he says, you know, Gareth, and we, he didn't know what I was preaching on because after he shared the story, he says, oh, that's going to fit really good in my sermon. Can I use that? And I'll always ask your permission, by the way, so don't, if we do coffee, it's okay, you know, but <clears throat> so I asked Michael's permission. But Michael was telling me, he says, man, you know, I'm doing sheet metal work and, and uh, I, you know, I like what I'm doing, moving in that direction, but I, yeah, I don't love the company that I'm in. But there's this guy, Travis, and, and Travis doesn't know the Lord. And I realize that that's why God has me there to be an encouragement and to help Travis know and understand that there's a God in heaven that loves him and cares about him. See, that's when you and I live that way, it changes even the very purpose and meaning of the jobs that we have. And this is what God has called us to. So the question that I want to uh, kind of close up with is today is, well, then how is it that we engage in this idea? We talked about neighborhoods to nations. How is it that we engage in God's restorative work here on earth? I hope you've got those foundations in place. Know that he's risen. Know that he's Lord. Know that he's renewing all things. And God's placed you where he's placed you for a very specific purpose. But this is what it says. And, and I want you to listen. Maybe Maybe you've heard this verse before, so I want you to listen just to the words, and don't think you know what it means, right? Just listen to the words, and we're going to unpack a few things and then close out with a few exhortations. But it says this in Matthew, verse 28. So Jesus has walked with these disciples, right? And he's about to ascend into heaven, and these are some of his last words to his disciples. How many of you know last words are important words, aren't they? You listen carefully to the last words. And this is what Jesus said. He came to and told his disciples... I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, right? So in, like, despite the fact that you've seen me crucified on the cross, despite the fact that you've seen me spat on and you've seen a, he- a, whor- a, thorn of, uh, or, or a crown of thorns put in my head, in spite of the belittling and all of the things that you've seen take place, now all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He goes on and he says this in verse uh, 19, Therefore, Go and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. And so I want to just unpack three things and then explore where is it then that we do this? The first thing is this. All authority has been given to Jesus. There's no authority that is outside of Jesus' authority. That Jesus is the one who is in control. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Prince of peace. And so he's speaking to his disciples and he says, now, listen, everything, you've walked with me. You've seen me walk on water. You've seen me command the storm to cease. You've seen me deliver people and heal people. You've seen me turn water into wine. You've seen me reprove and rebuke the Pharisees. Like, Like, you've seen me do all of this stuff. And you need to understand that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And and so we need to understand that, that who has the authority is not the boss. It's not the political parties. It's not the media. It's Jesus. And, I'm, I'm, and forgive me, I'm, I'm kind of being a proud dad a little bit because we had some things with my son this week, just where there were some assignments that were given to him in college, and, and he had to make a decision. Am I going to be, uh, is my allegiance to Jesus, the one who has all authority, or is my allegiance to the world and the culture and the story in which I seem to live and operate? 
And I'm really proud of him because he made a decision to say, you know what? I'm driving a stake into the ground. Jesus is the one in whom I place my trust. He's the one I'm going to be allegiant to. And we're faced with all kinds of those little micro decisions, aren't we, all the time? Right? You know that you're at the grocery store, you're waiting in line, and, and the Lord just prompts you to say something to the person that's behind you, you know? Maybe pray a prayer for them, maybe encourage them, maybe... And, and what happens is, you ever had that kind of sense of fear, kind of... Ah, ah, I'll move on. Right? Well... God wants us to recognize that all authority belongs to him. And because all authority belongs to him, we can step with confidence into those moments and not fear circumstance, right? It's like my son this week. He's putting his faith out on the line. And he's, you know, he actually said to me, he says, Dad, maybe I'll end up on some sort of blacklist at the school you know, for declaring my faith or something. You know? But he's willing to step into that space. Why? Because all authority, see, when all authority belongs to the Lord, I don't need to fear circumstance. I don't need to fear people. I don't need to fear the world in which I live. Now, we can be gracious. Remember what we read in 1 Peter? Be humble, be kind. Like, there's a way in which we approach all those things. But we can step in in confidence because all authority belongs to him. And then he said this, therefore. Now, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, it's, a, it's this word that joins. It's a conjunctive word. It joins to the statement right? But that happened before. So because all authority has been given to God, or sorry, given to Jesus in heaven and earth, therefore, in other words, you should now do something. Well, what is it that we should do? Well, it says this, and once again, you've heard this said a million times before, go and make disciples. Go and make, now that sounds really intimidating. Well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go on a missions trip this year? Like, am I supposed to take my vacation time and try to scrape the money together and I'm going to go to Kenya later this year or I'm going to go to Puerto Rico or I'm going to go to Israel or I'm going to go to Jordan? Like, like what, is it, what does that mean? You know, am I supposed to start a Bible study in my, my home? Like, maybe, I don't know. But, but here's something that we oftentimes miss. And once again, I'm not a Greek guy, but, you know, there's books out there that you can read. They're amazing. Um, and, and I was reading this book to try to understand what did Jesus mean when he said, go and make disciples. And the word that's actually used there is not so much go as much as it, now that you've heard me, uh, you should go. You should now get moving, right? In fact, a better definition or a better exp- or a interpretation of that Greek word would actually be this, as you go. So because all authority belongs to Jesus Christ in heaven and on earth, therefore, as you go, make disciples. So as I'm going through life, you know, remember that we talked about this, you know, Lightning McQueen, life is a highway, right? We talked about that. Life is a journey. And as I go on this journey, what you and I ought to be doing is making disciples. Like, Like, I ought to be a disciple, and I ought to be helping other people be disciples. Now, that sounds big and intimidating, but what if we were to break it down this way? We ought to just be helping one another take take the next step in Jesus. And for some people, just like Travis with with, uh, Michael, who works with Michael, his next step is, is a step closer to the cross, a step closer to recognizing that Jesus loves and cares for him. A step closer to recognizing, man, I'm a sinner in desperate need of grace. A step closer that says, man, I can't do enough good things to overcome the bad things that I go. I need someone to justify, to step into my place. Let me introduce you to Jesus. He gives his life to Jesus. And guess what happens is there's a cosmic party in heaven. It says that, by the way. The angels rejoice, okay? Okay. And so there's this rejoicing that happens. And then what happens is uh, Michael goes on a journey with Travis to say, hey, let me teach you how to read the Bible. Let's start in John. Let's start praying together. Let's take the first 15 minutes and just surrender our our hearts to Jesus. We say, your will, not my will be done today. Like, Like this is what it means to disciple. It means that as you go, while you're on this journey, every one of us ought to be making disciples, helping people take their next step in faith with Jesus Christ. That's not that intimidating, is it? You might just be changing someone's perspective and perception about God. You might be helping someone understand who Jesus is. You might be praying for somebody in the grocery line. You might be buying somebody a book at work. God will tell you what to do. He'll show you how to be involved with him because you're partnering with him in his restorative work. You don't do the restoration. He does. You're just a partner with him. So as you go, 
make disciples. Help people take their next step in faith. Oh, and by the way, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. Wait, you mean to say I don't have to do this in my own strength? God, I'm really scared. I'm really scared. I'm really scared. Don't be scared. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love. And... Okay, I can do this. Hey, I just feel to pray for you this morning. And you pray for them. And that person turns around and like, you have no idea what that meant. And here you were on this side of it going, oh God, I don't know if I could do it. And God's putting the whole thing together to say, help them take their next step in faith. And you step out in faith and you do it. And they respond by going, you have no idea what that means to me right now. And you realize, oh God, you really are in control. You really are over all things. Oh God, you really are with me. This is what it means for you and I that as we go, we make disciples. Now, I have 58 seconds. I can do this. Where, where, I mean, if you guys don't want to respond to Jesus, you don't want to know the rest of the message, it's okay, we can pray and finish right now. I mean, if that's what you want. Or do you want to know, well, then where does that start? Where does that take place? Well, the Bible makes it really clear, and I'm going to do this really very quickly, that discipleship, and I want to speak to parents for a minute, single parents, guardians, there's some grandparents in the room, discipleship starts in the home. Discipleship doesn't start in the church. Discipleship doesn't start at the grocery store at work. Discipleship starts in the home. And by the way, this isn't just for parents with kids or single parents with kids or grandparents who are taking care of kids. This is for the single adult who's living with a couple of roommates, right? This is for a husband and wife, a young married couple. This is for those that are older. My question is, how are you creating an environment in your home that's helping those who are in your home take their next step with Jesus? And and we've got to recognize in a world, I was out, out to dinner with a, a principal of a school, and he was just, you know, he was just telling, he's a Christian brother, he's an amazing man, and he was telling me this week, Gareth, you have no idea how schools or how the, the school system is discipling kids. And parents, if we don't step into this space and we don't disciple our kids, if we don't start to help our kids take their next step in faith, their next step in their, in their relationship with Jesus, someone else will. Now, we're going to do our best as a church family. We're going to come alongside you. Our children's ministry and student ministries, they're designed not to disciple your kids, but to come alongside you as you disciple your kids. And so Susan uh, is working. I'm working with Susan and and her whole team to try to figure out what does it mean for us to create family discipleship, not just Sunday morning experiences. How do we create resources and suggest books and apps and different things that you as parents could use to disciple your kids on this journey through life? Parents, can I tell you this? There is no greater discipleship journey that you will go on than that with your kids. If you will choose today, today by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, disciple your kids, I'm telling you there's no greater fruit that's going to take place in your life. That is your heritage. It's a heritage of faith. And if we don't step into that space and disciple our kids, who will? Somebody will. But God gave you those kids to help you disciple them to follow him, to become more and more like him. And so today, over over in our kids' ministry, your kids are learning that Jesus is the one that's in control. It's the exact same thing that you and I are learning, that Jesus is in control. In fact, they're actually teaching them this, that in your weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Now, how many of you know you're not going to hear that in school? No, you got to do it. You got to be strong. Believe in you. You do it. You do you, right? You be the hero. Chase after your story, right? Ignore your past. You know, it's like Elsa, let it go, right? You know, <clears throat> you know I'm going to, no rules for me, I'm ch- right? No, no, no. You're not, they're not, that's a countercultural story. Why? Because we're in a different story, aren't we? And so what we've got to be doing and what we're trying to do is support you uh, so that you can disciple your kids. We're going to come alongside and try to help with that. But you've got to be involved, parents. In fact, I, I throw some resources on the screen just to maybe get you started. If you use the QR code, there's a thing called the New City Catechism, and it's put out by Tim Keller, and it's designed, it's kind of question and answer that helps you just take one question a week with your kids that are maybe in elementary school and begin to ask and answer the question, right? 
Um, and so then there's some resources here. These are three amazing books. Uh, two of them I've read, The Intentional Father. Uh, my kids are a little bit older. But um, these, some of these books, that, that book, The Gospel Power Parenting, is probably one of the best books I've ever read on parenting. And I want to give you those. I want to challenge you, parents, get involved in discipling your kids. I know that you are, and we want to come alongside and help you do that in even stronger and better ways. So where does it start? It starts in the home, but it doesn't end in the home that we want to be those who go to neighborhoods, right? I said this earlier, God placed you in the neighborhood that he placed you in, that you're there for a purpose. Now we live in a backyard culture here in America, right? How many of you um, actually park your car in the garage? You can raise your hand. There you go. I'm really proud. I get both cars in the garage. That's a big deal. And the reason why I do that is so that I don't have to talk to my neighbors. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. I'm OCD and I like my car. I like my, well, the reason, to be honest with you, that, that, that's my man space in the house, the garage. And so I just want it organized and I want my cars in. But, but we live in a culture, don't we, where you, you, know, you kind of pull into the driveway, you hit the button, you go in, and, uh, and then you either hit the button while you're in your car. You don't even get out of your car to shut the door so that the neighbors won't see you, right? <laughs> But what if, what if God had placed you in that neighborhood to be salt and light? What if, what if you were to actually go out and start walking your neighborhood? What if you were to then start praying for your neighbors as you're out walking? What if, and I've started to be able to do this, where I'm out walking and, and, and some, it's kind of, sometimes people go, they'll be driving by and I see this, like this, the last week this SUV slowed up next to me. And the window comes down, and I'm like, uh-oh. And, uh, and the lady goes, hey, you, you're, you're the new pastor at Abundant Life Church. And my, my standard response is, I am, but please keep it quiet. I'm part of the witness protection program. <laughs> but what if while you're out walking and while you're out praying, you stopped and actually started to talk to relationship, or your, your neighbors? And what if your neighbors started to actually become friends? See, one in four Americans is lonely, which means one of the four neighbors around you is lonely. What if God placed you there to disciple them and help them take their next step in faith towards Jesus? I love uh, Jeff Boxall, who uh, he hosted this morning. Uh, Jeff buy, buys blazer tickets, uh, like season tickets. Like he, he buy, he, look, he works at the church, so he doesn't buy the 100 level ones, right? You know, he buys the ones that are like up in the nosebleed section, right? But part of why, um, well, we know he doesn't do it because he, the Blazers are that good, right? <laughs> He's, he buys them to go see the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors and all that stuff. But actually, part of the reason why Jeff buys those tickets is because Jeff, when he buys the tickets, he maps out the year and he figures out, who am I going to take with me to a game? See, Jeff said, I'm going to go reach my neighbors. Who is your neighbor? Well, your neighbor isn't just the person that lives next to you. Your person, person that you work with, person that you do go to the gym with, person that you do life with. And Jeff has that kind of mindset that says, I'm going to invite my neighbors to come. Why? See, he gets it. As I go to the Blazer game, I'm going to make a disciple. I'm going to build a relationship. I'm going to invest in a friendship. And maybe, just maybe, God's got a plan for that person and that person and that person. And he wants you to be involved with him restoring it. So we want to do homes, neighborhoods, in the region, and Jeff already addressed this, and I think I have a slide that just shows some of the things that we do uh, as a church, and you guys are so amazing at this, but Portland Rescue Mission and Every Child Oregon and Compassion Connect, Safety Compass, uh, Catalyst Partnerships, Echo Ranch, it's not just that we give to these ministry partnerships, we invest time and people into this. Why? Because we want to be a people. We want to be the kind of community. Can you imagine, what would they say about us? if we were to shut up shop? Would they say, man, where did abundant life go? There's like a void in our community. There's this missing gap in the community. But no, 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 we're gonna be the kind of people that are in the community that God has placed us in. And the last thing is simply this, that we wanna give, we wanna pray, give, and go to the nations. I don't know about you, but this week, man, and I know I've said it a few times already, but this week I realized in a fresh way, for God so loved the world. The Ukrainians and the Russians, right? The Moldovans, 
God so loved the world. And we here in the West, we here in this area of the country, man, we have resource. We're some of the richest people on the face of the planet. Now, you might not feel that way, but we are some of the richest people. God has blessed us financially, and we have a responsibility. Now, not, not that all of us can give and not that all of us can go, but all of us can pray. And, and on the screen, once again, you just see some of the things that we're doing around the world, some of the trips that we're going to take this year. Um, we are a church whose heart, like God, is for the nations of the world. And honestly, I, oh, I wish that all of us could go on a missions trip at some point. Because when you go on a missions trip, you start to realize the world's a whole lot bigger than the five square miles that I live in. There are people who love Jesus just as much as I do, but like have a totally different culture and perspective. And what happens when you go on a missions trip is not just, hey, I'm going to show up with you know, my suitcase and I'm going to make a difference here. Well, oftentimes what happens when you go on a missions trip is that God actually changes your heart. God puts his heart in you for the world. Not only for the world, but for the people where you live. That's the kind of church we want to be. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to stand. I'm going to pray. How many of you go, I, let's be this. How many of you want to join Jesus in his restorative work here on planet earth? If that's you, raise your hand this morning. I got my hands raised. So Lord, let's go close your eyes. Lord, here we are this morning. Lord, we're giving ourselves to you because you gave yourself to us. Lord Jesus, we have life where we should have had death. Lord Jesus, we have joy where there should have been sorrow and pain. And Lord, it's because you are risen. It's because you are Lord and all authority has been given to you. Lord, it's because, Lord, you are renewing all things and you have placed us here in this little patch of the world, Lord Jesus, because you want us to be involved with your story, with your restorative work here on the planet. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning, we are offering ourselves individually, but Lord, we're offering ourselves as a church family that, Lord, we will be those who pray. Lord, even as we gather tonight, Lord Jesus, we're setting a time, aside time to pursue your presence. Yes, for, Father, things that are going on in our own lives and our own hearts, but Lord Jesus, we're also setting time aside tonight because, Lord Jesus, we want to be those who stand in the gap. Lord Jesus, you said that you were looking for one that would stand in the gap, and Lord Jesus, tonight, Lord, I'm believing that there are going to be hundreds of us that show up. We're going to stand in the gap. Lord Jesus, we're going to give ourselves because what the world needs is not a a church that, Lord, is full of opinion and full of thoughts, but what the church or what the world needs is a praying church, is a worshiping church, is a church that's willing to lift up the name and the fame and the deeds of Jesus above all else. And so, Lord Jesus, oh God, tonight, today, this morning, Lord, in this moment, we're not defined by the moment in time. Lord Jesus, we're defined and a part of, and the world in which we live makes sense only as we understand the story to which you've invited us to be a part of. And so, Lord Jesus, today, Lord, we offer ourselves, Lord Jesus, to pursue your presence, to help people become more and more and more like you. Lord, to be a covenant community, loving and serving and looking out for one another. But Lord, let it spill out out of the walls of this church, out of the, Father, out of the relationships that exist in this room, but Lord, let it spill out into our homes and our neighborhoods and our city and our region and the nations of the world. Lord Jesus, I believe you're going to use us in unimaginable ways, and we're going to look back and go, what a privilege to be a part of that which God is doing on planet Earth. And so, Lord, we honor you in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, isn't God good? God is good.